Okay, uh, welcome to the afternoon session. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Ginevra Allen. Uh, Ginevra is a professor in elect electrical and computer engineering, statistics, and computer science at Rice University. She is also the founder of the Data to Knowledge Lab at Rice University. Ginevra has done amazing work on graphical models, tensors, statistical learning with applications to genomics uh, and the neural imaging. I kind of also work in this area. Um, I was telling Ginevra quite a few times I saw that I had some great ideas. I so go to Google, I search it, and then Ginevra already done it. I, I hope it's not happening today in her talk. <laughs> so, so today she's going to talk about a, a mini patch on Zombo's strategy for discovery and learning. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Hua. That was a really kind introduction. Um, and thanks so much for having me here. And um, thanks and congratulations to uh, Ken Lang for all of his work. So I am the only speaker today that has not collaborated yet <laughs> with uh, Ken. So maybe this is something you could do um, in the future. And um, I also was having lunch with Ken and kind of highlighted that there is going to be no optimization in this talk. It's going to be a computational talk with no optimization. And I kind of want to see how this flies. Um, so it would be interested to hear your feedback. Okay, so uh, I am I develop methodology to help people make discoveries from their very large, complex, and messy data sets. This is what I do. I really like talking to people about their really big and challenging data science problems to help them solve them. But of course, you saw in the title of the talk, I'm talking about ensemble learning today. So how on earth can ensemble learning be used to actually make discoveries from data sets? So just to review, ensemble learning, everybody knows these types of techniques from supervised learning. We've got random forest boosting, model stacking, and of course, these techniques take many uh, members, ensemble members, typically fit trees and aggregate their results. So it's really wisdom of the crowds. And these are great supervised learning methods. These give state-of-the-art off-the-shelf performance for tabular data. They still win all the Kaggle competitions, despite what people say about deep learning. Like a lot of those deep learning things, they'll take the final layer and then throw them in a random forest. And that's what wins the Kaggle competition. So ensemble learning is really, really powerful, basically, for supervised learning. We know this well. But is it great for computation? Is it great for interpreting or making discoveries from the data? Is it great for inference, for statistical inference? And these are some of the things that we're going to talk about. So specifically, I've been having a lot of fun lately with a new type of ensemble learning strategy that I call mini patch ensembles. Mini patch ensembles take your original data matrix like this, and it's a double subsampling, a double random subsampling strategy. So we're going to take a subset of the rows or observations simultaneously with a subset of the columns or features. So if you permute this um, matrix, you get this little patch here, and we're going to do this many, many times, okay? So the name, of course, is kind of a, uh, a mixture of uh, patches from image processing, that little patch of the matrix, and mini batches from stochastic optimization, of course. And interestingly, in 2012, this was actually proposed um, in the context of random forest ensembles in order to get memory efficient versions of random forest. Because if we remember random forest, at every split of the tree, they're subsampling different features, but it's not using the same set of features to grow the whole tree. So this was proposed as, as a memory efficient version of a random forest, but hasn't really caught on that much, but there's some other inspirations as well. And immediately you can clearly see this is very fast, especially if we take teensy tiny patches of our data, think the data is really, really big and we're gonna take this little, little tiny patch of data. So it's clearly gonna be fast, it's embarrassingly distributed and it's very memory efficient. We do not, especially if the data is really big, we don't have to store all of it in memory. And this also increases ensemble diversity, which is gonna have a lot of great things. Okay, so you can totally do this in the context of supervised learning. Here's a little plot with just some um, benchmark data sets that are standard in machine learning, and we're plotting accuracy here. Um, random forest is in blue and mini patches in red. 
Yay, the accuracy is basically the same as random forest, sometimes mini patch forest or even better, yay. The timing is always improved. These are actually not running this in parallel. This is just on a straight CPU, not in parallel, and the timing's still faster than a random forest. So yay, this is uh, pretty simple. You can do this in supervised learning. And again, ensemble learning is widely used in supervised settings. But today, I'm going to focus on using ensemble learning in all the cases where you didn't think ensemble learning could be used. Specifically, we want to leverage these great properties of ensemble learning and specific advantages of double subsampling that we get from mini patch learning to do discovery. And today I'm going to talk about this in the context of unsupervised learning and also inference. And I'm going to talk about this in the context of feature importance inference. So I've been working on lots of things here um, related to mini patch ensembles, but um, I'm just gonna give a brief overview of clustering and graph learning and hopefully spend a little bit more time on the inference stuff in the talk today. Okay, so a little bit of clustering. We all know what the goal of clustering is. It's to discover groups in our data sets. And um, uh, recently I've been very motivated to study this in the context of single cell uh, RNA sequencing where we have maybe tens of thousands of cells. They all come from different cell types. We're trying to group them together. And of course, there's a tons of great approaches here. Uh, K-means, hierarchical, for this crowd, I should say convex clustering also. Um, so lots of great techniques, but what about ensemble learning? Can you use ensemble learning in the context of clustering? Well, it turns out there's um, uh, this technique that's actually fairly widely known in the bioinformatics community called consensus clustering. The idea of this technique is to subsample observations, cluster, every time you take a subsample, you fit a cluster, and then you can't uh, overlap the clusters very well. So what you record is, is observation I and observation I prime, do they belong to the same cluster? So you record co-cluster -clus occurrences amongst observations, and then ensemble or average these results. So let me show you a picture before I go back to the advantages and disadvantages. So we're looking at a heat map here of the consensus matrix or the co-cluster occurrence matrix where dark blue is one and yellow is a zero value. So dark blue of one means these two observations co-clustered and occurred together all the time. So if we could look, maybe this cluster, this looks like a pretty like a uh, cluster, pretty tight cluster where these actually co-occur a lot. These guys right here, it's a little bit harder to tell. Are they, should they be part of this cluster? Should this whole thing be part of a cluster there? So you get a lot more information than just the number of, just the cluster membership that comes out. You get a lot more information from this. So there's been a lot of advantages of using consensus clustering. You can use this to assess the reliability of your clustering results and help you choose the number of clusters instead of just, instead of using some other strategies. It's also been shown to improve clustering performance in many kind of challenging problems. Of course, there's some disadvantages. This is computationally pretty prohibitive, especially in large scale, say single cell sequencing type stuff, where you're gonna need to cluster on the order of 10,000 cells a thousand times. I mean, you know, you're repeating this, this, this can be quite uh, computationally intensive, and it's also um, lack of interpretability. So we say, okay, well, consensus clustering, subsamples, observations, and clusters, why not use mini patches for this? And so why not use mini patch consensus clustering? Well, we did this, of course, and you know, there's some improvements, there's some computational improvements, yay, yay. Um, but there are some challenges here, especially when you're using this on genomic scale data. And this is because when you subsample a tiny, tiny little mini patch of features here, most of the features that you subsample, especially in high dimensional settings, are probably noise, right? They probably have no signal whatsoever to help you cluster. And so if you're subsampling these, it's going to degrade the performance. And you also might get unrepresentative observations as well. So we said, well, okay, random subsampling of mini patches is a real problem. So why don't we adaptively? subsample mini patches. And specifically, we're doing double adaptive subsampling. Why don't we adaptively learn features and observations? 
And there's many adaptive sampling schemes, but we looked for inspiration to the multi arm bandit literature and the reinforcement learning literature, where um, sometimes this is described as an octopus playing slot machines, kind of weird. But basically what this does is there's each slot machine has a slightly different reward. And at each stage, you can sub you can select a subset of slot machines. And what you want to do is typically explore all available options. Um, in this case, the octopus playing slot machines. In our cases, you explore all the features or observations. But once you find, once you think you found a slot machine that has a good reward, you want to pull that lever more often and you want to sample the features and observations with a higher probability that are more likely to be useful for clustering. And that's exactly what we do. And so we have a burn-in stage where we just do random subsampling of features and observations. And then we have this adaptive stage where we explore and we've got some fixed probability that any observation or feature can be selected in a mini patch. But we've got this exploitation part where we're trying to sample features that show a difference across clusters more often. So we've got an active set of features and our active set of observations, we actually uh, uh, sample more frequently the observations that we're uncertain about. So the inspiration here was from boosting, where in boosting, you want to actually learn on the observations that are misclassified. So here we're learning on the observations that are not clustered well. And uh, then we update the active sets and continue. And this strategy works really well. So um, this is kind of a lot of plots here. Our method impact, oh yeah, my student named it impact, um, uh, is in red. Um, and the ARI is the adjusted RAND index. So this is a measure of clustering performance on the y-axis. On the x-axis is the signal to noise ratio of the clustering strength. And these are some other methods. And this is a pretty hard situation because there's pretty strong correlation. And it is a high dimensional setup here. And we see our method does very well and can capture the full clustering assignments. The F1 score here is showing, uh, can we accurately select those 50 important features? And our method gets them right away and the other methods do not. And if you look at the computational order, this is on a log scale, our method is actually right here. And um, it's actually the same computational order as hierarchical clustering. So it's about just as fast as hierarchical clustering. We've got, this is a single cell sequencing um, uh, simulation. It's a, a simulator specifically for single cell sequencing data. Again, our method is in red. So you see like superior clustering performance. And um, we've got lots of data sets. I just kind of want to show you the consensus pictures because I think that makes more sense. So what we're showing here is this top panel is our method impact using mini patch clustering. The bottom panel is regular consensus clustering. And let's just look at the pan can data set. So all three of these are genomics data sets. And in this pan can data set, you see there's a lot of confusion between in regular consensus clustering between this cluster and this cluster right here. There's a lot of points where we're uncertain which cluster they belong to. But our method separates them quite well. We see this kind of strong block diagonal structure here. So, um, and finds biologically relevant um, genes as well. Okay, so that was kind of a quick overview, but hopefully I, 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 I illustrated that you can use ensemble learning for a bit more than just supervised tasks. So here we actually leveraged ensemble learning to do adaptive subsampling for clustering, but, what about another unsupervised learning task that's notoriously very challenging? And we actually heard Johan talk about this earlier in the morning, and that's graph learning. Specifically, we want to learn the graph structure of a probabilistic graphical model. And these are just multivariate distributions that can be represented as a network, where every edge in our network denotes a conditional dependence relationship amongst two uh, features or, or two nodes in our graph. And there's a lot of great properties of this from both a probabilistic perspective and a computational perspective. And what we're gonna be interested in studying is structural learning of graphical models. So the idea here is you observe data on the nodes of your graph. You don't observe the edges and your goal is to learn the edges of the graph. And of course, in Gaussian graphical models, this is a very nice task because um, there's a, a very nice representation of conditional dependence, specifically zeros in the off diagonal elements of the inverse covariance matrix or precision matrix correspond to conditional independence. 
And there's a very well-known optimization problem uh, to solve this called the graphical lasso, which again, we actually heard about this morning. And this is just doing sparse maximum likelihood estimation here. This is the log likelihood of the uh, centered multivariate normal. And here we have an L1 penalty on the off-diagonal elements. Okay, super well-studied problem. There are tens of thousands of papers on this. Okay, so you're probably like, what is there left to do? Well, hopefully actually Johan already convinced you there's more left to do because he said computationally, this is actually still a really hard problem. Problem. And that's exactly what we're going to try to tackle here, because I've been collaborating with some neuroscientists, and we have absolutely huge uh, neuroscience data where we're trying to learn the functional connectivity, so learn the network amongst 75,000 neurons in, this is a mouse brain, in the visual cortex of the mouse brain. Okay, so we tried to use the fastest existing approach, big, quick, um, uh, and this is actually a quasi-Newton method, and we ran this on 75,000 nodes for a chain graph and one single value of lambda, and lambda controls the sparsity, so you have to tune that guy. So that's actually really hard. One single value of lambda, and it took over 24 hours to run on 75,000 neurons. We're, we were just like, well, this is not going to work, right, for our like neuroscience scale data. So we said, well... And we use mini patches, which are really fast to potentially solve this problem. So specifically, can we randomly sample little patches of our really huge data matrix here and learn these tiny little graphs for each of these patches and somehow ensemble the results together? So in clustering, we could easily do that by ensembling whole cluster occurrences. But there's a really big challenge here. We can't just ensemble these edges. And the reason is, is because we run into this latent variable problem. Specifically, if we have this little mini patch of the data here, then we've got all of these features are unobserved nodes or variables that were not sampled into the mini patch. Okay. So in graphical models, we're interested in estimating conditional dependencies. So we need to condition on these guys, but we just sampled them and we don't observe them. Whoopsie doopsies. Okay, so this definitely seems like a really big problem. So, it, and we've shown in another paper actually that if the true graph is this, um, having a large number of unobserved nodes uh, always yields false positives. So, in um, you can show that under certain settings you won't yield false negatives, but you will always estimate a ton of false positives here. Now, there's a little bit of a bigger problem. In the latent variable graphical model literature, um, there have been some very cool approaches that have been proposed by Venkat, who's at Caltech. And um, this is a sparse and low rank kind of structure. So dealing with the latent variables via low rank structure, nice convex pro uh, program that solves this problem, but it is computationally really slow to solve. And there's a lot of very finicky parameter tuning there to deal with, okay? So this actually creates an even bigger challenge. But uh, recently, very recently, um, a student and I actually solved this via very, very simple computational strategy. And all we did was take existing graph estimators, graph glasso, neighborhood selection, climb, I don't care what you use, use any existing graphical model estimator, hard threshold it. And under um, a set of assumptions, and the set of assumptions does not require an incoherence condition. Specifically, we require a minimum edge strength condition. And the intuition here is that the minimum signal strength of every edge needs to be larger than the false positives induced by uh, latent variables. Okay. So when that condition is satisfied, we actually have finite sample and high dimensional graph selection consistency. And interestingly, this is improved sample complexity. This is the same sample complexity as that of the neighborhood estimator, neighborhood selection estimator for the graphical model. And that is a huge improvement over the sample complexity of the existing latent variable graphical models. OK, so in, in our mind, we're, we, we really like this approach because it's fast computationally, but it's also a win statistically in terms of graph estimation. OK, so now if we go back to this idea of mini patches, now what we have is we've got a really fast computational way and great statistical way of dealing with latent variables for each patch. So now the idea is pretty simple. 
why not just select randomly all of these little mini patches and learn the graph by thresholding the graphical lasso on each mini patch, okay? So we're gonna threshold the graphical lasso. We learn the threshold level via the EBIC um, uh, internally for each mini patch. And we're just gonna ensemble or average all the edge selection events over the mini patches and retain those edges that are stable or selected regularly, okay? So super simple, really fast. Um, so we can show, we can leverage all that great theory on the latent variable graphical model to show that this actually has finite sample consistency under no incoherence or um, irrepresentable conditions. So I think these are much milder assumptions than that of the graphical lasso. And this is a very fast, and if you're solving huge, huge graphical model problems, dealing with memory you've got p choose two parameters that you're learning so dealing with memory is a big problem and this is very memory efficient because you're only learning these tiny graphs and they're completely decoupled okay so some timing results well this is both um accuracy and timing so this is a pretty small simulation this is a small world graph right here what we're showing is the f1 score so this is just a like a geometric mean of false positives and false negatives or no true positives true negatives um so one means perfect graph recovery and zero means imperfect and we have computational time on a log scale here um, and what we did is this is our method up here, mini patch graph in red. And these are all the other available software packages in both R and Python. We like ran, uh, actually, I didn't run any of it. My student, mm -hmm. Tianyi, ran all of them. Um, and we see that the mini patch graph estimator is by far the best estimator. Um, this second place method, a former student of mine, this is her Python package, Mandari Narayan's package. But it took under a minute for ours to run, and it took almost 10 hours for that next competing method. So this is just the standard benchmark chain graph, and we specifically wanted to compare to the big quick method. So this is the same simulation setup as the big quick, which is the current state of the art uh, for, graph, for graph learning problems. And on the top panel, we have computation time. Our method is in red, and excuse me, this is a log scale. And so um, we actually stopped and killed the big quick method and another neighborhood selection because they had taken over eight hours at 20,000 nodes. Ours took 30 minutes on um, 20,000 node graph. This is the statistical accuracy. And you can see our statistical accuracy is far superior of both other methods uh, for these number of nodes as well. So seems like a win-win. We applied these to really big neuroscience data sets. Um, so this is a 14,000 14, neurons and um, a little over 4,000 observations. And ours took about 11 minutes to run. This is with data-driven tuning of the, of the sparsity level of the graph. And these others took over 11 hours. So a enormous order of magnitude difference in computational time. And this is an estimate of the graph you get. You can't see that much here, but this is a very, like, very clear small world structure. And there's a couple of neurons that are like really big hub neurons that are potentially interesting to our neuroscience collaborators here from this graph. Okay, I might pause here. I can maybe take a quick set of questions on these before I jump into inference, or I could jump into inference. Yeah, I'll do take quick questions. Yeah. Well, like following that there's an extra parameter with yeah, so when we fit the graphical lasso to each mini patch, we fit the graphical lasso with a fixed lambda that's fairly small. It's on the order of square, uh, log, square root log p over n. So just very the normal rate for lambda, but pretty small. The only thing we tune is the threshold level, and that's via EBIC. So we, we're doing it tuning internally on each mini patch. Yeah. It's not clear to me how we get the final estimate of the standard after thresholding. Yeah, so once we hard threshold each mini patch, we just record a zero or a one if there's an edge there or not. And then we just average over all random mini patches, we average all of those edge selection events. So we for every edge, we get a number between zero and one. And then we actually found like you can tune that to decide the sparsity level. We found we don't even need to tune it. We just set 0.5. If it's greater than 0.5, it's an edge. If it's less than 0.5, it's not. And that works perfectly fine in practice. And our theory supports that you don't really need to tune that 
that well. Under these assumptions, there should be clear separation between true edges and non edges. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, that's a great question. Size of mini patches. I knew someone was, I did not have a slide on that and I just knew someone was going to ask. Yeah, there's totally going to be a little bit of trade off here with the size of the mini patch and the statistical accuracy versus the computational time. And specifically, we're walking a very fine line because the size, if the mini patch is too small, the number of latent variables gets too big. And the, this impacts the statistical results because we need our minimum edge strength to be larger than that of any of the false positives induced. So the more potential latent variables they are, the more potential false positives and the more signal strength we need to recover the graph. So um, statistically, we don't, from a statistical perspective, we don't want the mini patches to be too tiny. But from a computational one, if we let them be, the bigger we let them be, the worse the performance. So in these examples, when we reached over 10,000 nodes, we ended up taking the mini patches to be between one to 5% of the graph um, or one to 5% of the nodes. And that seemed to work pretty well in practice, but there, I completely concede there's some wiggle room there and how you decide this. Okay, uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, in this part of the talk, we these mini patches are sampled completely at random. Um, the first part of the talk on clustering, they were sampled adaptively. So, yes, we have not explored this yet. We are hoping to get to this. I do think that you can absolutely leverage some type of adaptive sampling of the mini patches to learn the graph even faster, right, with even improved statistical accuracy. Uh, we have not done that yet. I think that's a future uh, research problem. Yeah. Cool. I'm going to jump ahead to inference. Okay. Cool. So, um, machine learning. It's used everywhere these days. It's used in cars or at least Teslas. It's used in electronic um, health records. It's used in a lot of different things. Everybody says these are really important high stakes uh, locations that we're using machine learning. Can we really trust the results? And the answer that most people give is, well, we need to make all of the machine learning results interpretable or explainable to humans. Well, I'm going to ask here, cool. Sure, we can get interpretations from machine learning, but can we really trust those interpretations, right? Um, and so let's talk about this a little bit. So in supervised learning, one of the most uh, common and popular machine learning interpretation or explanation is feature importance. And this is the level of influence that each feature has on the model predictions in a supervised setting. So random forest, you can look at the feature importance score for the trees, you can look at the coefficients from a linear model or an additive model, you can actually look at integrated gradients or um, uh, layer wise relevance propagation of the features in deep learning to get a feature importance score. So there's tons of this model specific feature importance scores out there. But we're more interested in model agnostic feature importance scores. And the reason is, is because they can be used on any machine learning model out there and they have the same interpretation. So this allows us to actually compare interpretations across models in a way that you can never do with model specific feature importance. And specifically, you might have heard of like permutation approaches, uh, Shapley values. We're going to use feature occlusion in this talk. And specifically, when um, one feature is not in the model, how does it affect the model prediction? So there's they, people have proposed these as metrics, but what about statistical inference on these approaches? So there's actually been a ton of recent work on a related area in machine learning called conformal inference or distribution free inference on the predictions. So quantifying the uncertainty of the predictions. And there's been a lot of fantastic recent work on this, but these are all for predictions, not for interpretations. More interestingly and more relevantly for, for our work, there's actually been in the past couple of years, a slew of new methods um, specifically fo focusing on feature occlusion inference. Um, because this is a tractable, a, one of the most tractable uh, metrics to do inference on, but all of these make 
distributional assumptions about the data, assume you know the distributional assumption of the data, assume that the, your model is consistent. So like we know the model consistency of linear models, do we have random forest, deep learning? Like we can't apply it to those models. They're only used for regression or applied data splitting. So our goal is to develop a fast computational assumption light model agnostic and distribution free way to quantify the uncertainty of the feature importance. Basically, we just want a confidence interval for the feature importance score. But of course, this is a bit of a challenge. And to set up our problem, let's um, inspect some prior work on leave one covariate out inference or loco inference. This was proposed by uh, a group at CMU. And the idea here is to conduct inference on the feature occlusion, basically the predictions without feature J and the predictions with feature J. So the inference target right here is the expectation of the error. So this is just a prediction error function. This can be any function. We actually show all this needs to be as Lipschitz. You don't need it to worry about uh, what this is. Some error between our true label Y and mu sub minus J is our prediction without J and mu is our prediction with um, J. Okay, so basically, how do the, the prediction error change when we have without J in the model and with J? And if you stare hard enough at the delta, you'll see if J is really important, delta should be positive. And if it's not, it should be close to zero and maybe even possibly negative. So their approach to this was to split the data into a training set and an inference set. Specifically on the training set, they fit all the predictive models by leaving one feature J out at a time. And then they made the predictions on the inference set and they used this kind of test set uh, residuals in a conformal inference manner to construct the confidence intervals for the features, okay? Well, there's a couple of things that are great about this method. It really is only model agnostic, although these original papers only had theory for the regression setting, and it's fairly assumption light. But there's definitely some computational challenges here because think about it. You're leaving each feature J and fitting, so you're fitting at least P different models to your data, leaving each one out. Now, that might be perfectly fine if it's a linear regression model, might not be great if it's a big deep learning model. Right, So it's definitely computationally prohibitive, and also data splitting has been shown to lose statistical power in a variety of settings. So we want to address both of these issues. And since this is a talk on mini patches, of course, we said, why not use mini patches, right? And these are really primed for this setting because they're doing double subsampling. And every time you double subsample, you're leaving out some, uh, some observations or rows and some features or columns. So can we actually leverage this to do fast inference? And so our approach is really simple, okay? So we're gonna fit a mini patch ensembles using whatever you want. You can use trees, deep learning, SVMs, regression, kernels, whatever. So fit some type of model. And then after you fit the big mini patch ensemble, you can actually get inference for free computationally without anything doing anything else by doing the following. We're going to calculate the Lu estimator or the leave one observation out. So this is just view hat of minus i by simply ensembling or averaging over all many patches that did not contain observation i. If you think about this, this is like out of bag errors from say bagging or random force. This is essentially what this is, but for many patches. So we get this Lu estimator, but now we also need to leave one feature out at a time. So now we get the local Lu estimator, um, or basically we are averaging over all ensembles that don't contain observation I and don't contain feature J. Okay. And what we can do is now we have a built-in test set from the Lu's that we get, the Lu estimates, and we have automatically this minus loco Lu that we've left out. So no additional computation is needed, and we can directly compute these feature occlusion scores. And then we can construct asymptotically normal confidence intervals for delta J. Okay, so the important thing here is once we actually do mini patch learning, the inference part is free, right? No additional computation is needed to conduct inference. 
And you might say, okay, well, that, that's great that you did all of this, but are these valid confidence intervals or hypothesis tests that you're getting for delta J? So it turns out, okay, well, there's clearly a theorem here that says, yes, it, it is a valid asymptotic uh, confidence interval, but there's actually a lot that goes on behind the scenes for this because since we're leaving one observation out and one feature out at a time, the mini patches are all super de duper correlated with each other, right? So none of the, uh, the kind of central limit theorems for dependent data hold for this. This is too dependent basically to apply those types of theory techniques. So we actually needed to make assumptions on the show that the mini patches, uh, since we're ensembling, it's a stabilizing strategy. And we use that and we leverage also recent central limit theorems for cross-validation to show um, valid asymptotic coverage here. Uh, so going one step beyond this, I'm gonna kind of skip this part, but this was for uh, an individual feature. So a feature importance score, but we can also use the same procedure to get valid prediction intervals. And basically all this does is if, if you're familiar with the Jackknife Plus framework, for um, conformal inference, which is basically leaving one observation out at a time, we've got these fantastic Lu estimates, our leave one observation out estimates for mini patch learning that we can just plug into the existing Jackknife Plus framework. And so automatically our approach also gives valid confidence intervals for predictions, for a new prediction Y n plus one at the same time that we can get uh, confidence intervals for the features, okay? So let me sort of convince you that this works. Um, so this is just showing uh, this a simple simulation where we're showing the coverage as we change n. The coverage should be close to um, uh, should be close to 0.9. Here it is, and the width decreases with n. Okay, that's that's somewhat simple. Computationally, this is uh, using the loco split method, and our method is in blue. And you see loco split, um, especially as the this is not even a big data set, and loco split is already taking forever to run. Our method uh, increases very mildly. Um, we actually take, uh, you're going to ask about mini patch size here. The theory tells us our mini patch sizes should be the square root of uh, P and the square root of N. So these are teensy, teensy, tiny mini patches, like very tiny mini patches. So this is actually really fast to run. Um, so there are some existing methods for feature occlusion inference out there in a model agnostic manner, but they do make assumptions sometimes on the distribution of the data. We make no assumptions on the distribution of the data, but here I'm comparing our method, which is in red, to some of these other methods that have been proposed in the literature, and I'm showing you as I'm increasing I'm increasing the signal to noise ratio for a single feature. I'm plotting the power here for random force ridge regression. Our paper has a whole lot more models. And what you see, let's just like look at this um, plot here. What you see is you might be like, oh, these other methods actually have better power than your approach. But that's not really true because their type one error is, is not controlled um, when SNR is actually equal to zero here. So we actually have pretty good type one error control in the non-correlated settings. The correlated settings are a whole different ballgame. And out of the methods that have proper type one error control, ours has the highest power. Um, our, we really see a difference. That was all regression simulations. These are classification. We really see a huge improvement over existing approaches when it comes to classification. I mentioned there's not many existing methods that can do uh, model agnostic inference for classification and ours can. Um, we can also use this to select features. Here I'm showing F1 score. Our method is in red. It does very well in regression simulations. This is if you do a test to select each feature with family-wise error rate control. Um, but it does really well in classification settings. Again, there's not really many other methods that even work in this setting to do classification. And just to show you what these results look like, so this is actually a toy data set that's actually used in many of these inference papers, so it's a good benchmark to compare to since everybody has used this data set. It's a data set predicting African heart disease, and the features are things like tobacco, family history use, um, type A, obesity, and so forth. And what we're plotting here are the confidence intervals. So the length here that you see are the confidence intervals for each one of those features of our method, which is in red, loco split in pink and CPI. This is the conditional predictive inference method in green. 
And what you see, first of all, is that you really see that our width, we have so much more power than these other methods. Our width is quite a bit smaller. The way to interpret this is we would interpret um, basically any of these intervals whose lower limits, and these are multiplicity corrected intervals, any of these whose lower limit is greater than zero, we would call statistically significant. So age here and family history and tobacco are actually statistically significant for our method. If you look at the other methods, they actually have none that are statistically significant because their intervals are quite a bit wider. So they miss some of those features and some p-values also. So I'm just gonna summarize here. So I've introduced mini patch learning. And again, I've been doing a lot of work uh, in other areas of mini patch learning as well. And I really like this approach because it's really fast and memory efficient. It's easy to distribute. Um, and But there's also a lot of advantages from double subsampling that you can use for a lot of statistical tasks beyond just supervised learning. And so today I talked about using it for unsupervised learning in clustering and graph learning problems and also for inference. But there's an absolute tons more that you could do. And I guess the take home message I want to leave you with is um, you know, uh, maybe ensemble learning is really powerful. Maybe we should be using this more and ensembling simple methods together might be more powerful than solving one big complicated um, problem. And there is some software available if you want to try these out. Would love feedback on these also if you use these approaches. So definitely want to acknowledge all my students who worked on this. So Tianyi, um, and Minji worked on the graph learning problem. Luchin worked on the clustering problem and Lily Zhang, uh, uh, clustering and the inference problem and Lily Zhang worked on the uh, inference problem. And Lily and Minji will be on the job market next year, not this year, just pointing that out. Um, okay, and some references. Thank you very much. <laughs> What do you do about missing features? What do I do about missing features? That's a great question. So, uh, so far, I haven't done anything about that, but I definitely think um, one would need to in the future. Um, I think uh, one could, we thought about this, trying to cleverly sample the mini patches so that we're sampling um, the observed parts of the data, but it becomes really challenging to sample that. And it really, depending on your level of missingness can constrain how you sample them. So it's, we're getting very non-random mini patches that have some weird effects. So our inference method specifically needs random mini patches for the inference to be valid. So I don't quite have a good answer to that question yet, but I do think that's a future area of research. So excellent talk. Um, I had a quick question on the clustering part when you were talking about smarter subsets and then trying to distort the noisy ones. So just my limited experience with these kind of mini batch methods are like, let's say you just get the gradient, it's like mm -hmm. you kind of want to scale up your gradient by the inverse of the size and if you're, if you're sampling from a different distribution, you want to account for that accordingly. So here, I think it's very intuitive. You have sort of a reinforcement learning style mm -hmm. driven strategy, but do you need to somehow like correct for it to make sure you're still sampling from like somehow the right population or mm -hmm. are you worried for instance about that kind of leading you, biasing you toward like maybe a local or some kind of, you know, like getting stuck somewhere? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really great question. So um, yeah, I, I think if you're only doing like a, an exploiting scheme, so if you only sample, for example, based upon like probabilities, learned probabilities, you can very easily get stuck in local solutions, just like you can with stochastic gradient descent. And that's why we actually use this exploitation exploration, because there's a small fixed probability that of random sampling each time. And in the reinforcement learning literature, there's a lot of theory that shows that that, that actually corrects this problem. So you don't get stuck in a local solution. We do not we haven't done theory yet, I should say, on using those strategies in adaptive mini patch learning, but I do think you can probably adapt that theory and show that it works. We just empirically found that sampling uh, proportional to the probability actually gets gets stuck more often than this exploitation exploration. Yeah. 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 Um, so it's like a couple of 
So I, yeah, these guys right here look like significantly below zero. And I, I think the interpretation there is that these, including these in a model actively hurt your prediction. So basically if you're fitting a random forest, you should not include these two features. They will actively hurt your predictions. So this could tell you features to leave out as well. Cool. Yeah, <laughs>